Well, I'm glad that you are here this morning. I'm glad that you are joining us online. As a matter of fact, we are always glad that you are with us, whether you are physically in this space or watching us sometime in the future. We know there are people who watch us later in the week, and we welcome you guys with us also. We are on part two of our series titled, Putting an X Through Anxiety. And we are using as a resource the Louis Giglio book uh, by the same time title, Putting an X Through Anxiety, and while we aren't going exactly through the book, we want you to read the book because it is a fabulous resource to go alongside uh, our sermon series. It's one of those books that you're going to want to have on your shelf, and it might not be because you're experiencing anxiety right now or stress. It might be because there's somebody in your life who's experiencing anxiety and stress and you want to be able to help them. But here's the thing. There will be some time in your life when you are going to need a resource like this. Every single one of us either goes through or knows someone who goes through times and periods of anxiety that are overwhelming, and a godly resource is a good benefit. There's lots of scriptures that are quoted in there, so you can, you can reference back. A good resource. So if you can't afford the $10, we're selling them at the Welcome Center. They actually cost us a little bit more than that. You come see me. Uh, because I want to make sure that everyone has this resource. Don't be too proud to say I can't afford the 10 bucks. Because if, if you can't, we'll make sure that we get it in your hands. Last week, we closed with action step number one. And with action step number one, we were challenged to spend our week and to concentrate on working on this process of surrendering stress and anxiety to the Lord, handing it over to him. When, when we are overwhelmed with cares and worries and concerns, that we get in this habit of casting them upon the Lord. That's the verbiage that Jesus used, cast your cares. So um, the thing is, he doesn't just say this is a good suggestion. He doesn't just say that casting our cares, surrendering them to him might help us out. He, he gives us a directive. He says, this is what you are to do. You are to cast your cares upon the Lord. It's not that it's just a wise choice. It is a directive. He is saying you are not supposed to be hanging on to, holding on to, hoarding up your own worries and cares. We are to be handing them over. 1 Peter 5, 7 puts it this way. Give all your worries. I like this. Because there are times that I feel like, sometimes I feel like um, I'm talking to God about something that's, that's so tiny that maybe he doesn't care about it. Not, not, not just the big things, but I want to talk to him about everything. And sometimes the things I talk to him, I feel like might be, be silly. And then I remember this passage, all your cares, whatever they are, whether they are ginormous or whether they are teeny tiny whatever they are, give all of your worries, all of them, to God. For he cares about you. And when we truly get this in our heads, when we wrap our minds around the fact that he doesn't just care about the monumental huge things, he cares about the medium-sized things, and he cares about the teeny tiny things, and he cares about them all. And when we get that in our head, we are on the right track toward doing two very important things, confronting stress and anxiety and minimizing stress and anxiety. Two words that I want you to have in your dictionary when dealing with stress and anxiety are confronting and minimizing. Because the truth is, we are never going to erase it. Not as long as we are walk, walking on this face of, of, of the earth. We won't erase the fact. From time to time, we're going to have stress and anxiety. It's going to rear its ugly head at the most, uh, when, when we do not want it to happen. Most inconvenient time. It will happen. But when we know how to confront it and then how to minimize it, that's when we're going to have success. 
And that's when stress and anxiety will no longer own us. When we have the ability to knock it down because we have the godly tools, because we have instruction from the Lord, and and we are following the steps we need to be taking when, when stress and anxiety appear, we can knock it down. And casting our cares upon the Lord, it is as simple as saying, Lord, take this. Lord, uh, take this heartache. Lord, take this, this ugliness that's owning my mind. Take this struggle. Take this fear. Take this doubt. Lord, take this illness. Take this immorality that I have been playing with for far too long. Take this failure that makes me feel worthless. Lord, take this transgression. Take it. Take it. I hand it over to you. This is the dread and the panic. I hand it over to you. Lord, take this. And that is action step number one. But we got to have the foundation of action step number one for us to move on and for us to build. Each week through this series, we're going to have an action step, something that we are going to focus on for the whole week. And as we do that, we are going to get this strength that comes from experiencing Jesus. You see, when we experience Jesus, and that's our theme for the, for the church for 2023, when we experience Jesus, we find that we are no longer easily distracted by the wiles of the enemy. You see, last week we said that, that sin will open the door to stress and anxiety. Not all stress and anxiety come about because of sin. This week, as we are, we are talking about this, this issue of, of anxiety, what we're talking about is when the enemy throws the anxiety at us, because he will. And so if we are able to not be distracted by him, and, and we have our focus on experiencing Jesus, we're going to have a strength that allows us to push through. So instead of being tangled up by the lies and the uncertainty and the confusion that, that, that the enemy likes to send our way, Jesus allows us this opportunity to experience his power, his might, his strength, his unconditional love. Lord, take this is a perfect place to start, but we have to build upon that. There are some other tools that we need so that we will be in God's will every time the enemy comes calling. Not just because of anxiety connected to sin, but, but this week we're talking about anxiety connected to the enemy when he is trying to distract us. Matthew uh, 5, 8, and 9 tells us, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work. My friends, this is work. What we, what we are talking about isn't something that we can just open a book, read a few pages, and, and walk away and go, okay, got this. This is work. God blesses those who work for peace, for they shall be called children of God. And so last week, as we talked about working at this task of saying, Lord, surrender, I surrender this. Lord, take this. Even if we have to do it a hundred times a day, this week is no different. As we are talking about this, this notion of we must do it right now. That's action step number two. We got to get a grasp. We got to get a grasp on what it looks like to understand this word immediate. Things that we need to know how to do immediately and why not waiting is so important. When we trust Jesus enough to cast our cares upon him, our worries, what it does is it frees us up to be present in this moment. And this issue of of when the enemy throws stress and anxiety uh, at us, it keeps us from living in this moment. It keeps us from experiencing what God wants us to experience right now. 
Tackling anxiety isn't something that we can set on the back burner. It's like if there's a boiling pot and we put a lid upon it and pretend that we're going to ignore it, that pot will boil over and it will make a huge mess. I know this because Easter, I ran home and I I had my broth for my noodles on the stove. The pot was boiling Threw the noodles in. I was so excited. Everything was going great. Everything was on schedule. Oh, my guests were going to be there in 35 minutes. And for some stupid reason, I took the lid and put it on top of that boiling pot. And I'm standing at the sink and I hear, giant mess. It's Easter. Now the guests are going to be there in 20 minutes. 36 people for lunch. Stress. It was Mike's fault. Let's, Let's blame Mike. That's exactly what anxiety does, my friends. And that's what it looks like. When, when we try to ignore it, it's like a boiling pot of noodles. Put the lid on it and it just boils over and it makes such a big mess we got to deal with stress and anxiety immediately. We, we don't wait until we think it's going to get easier because it's never going to get easier than right now. It will only become more complicated. We can't ignore it. We must deal with it immediately. We can't wait until we think that we can figure out where it came from because here's the thing. If this is, if this is stress and anxiety that the enemy is throwing at you, you're never going to understand where it's coming from. Not in the way that you understand why he's doing what he's doing or why he's messing with you. So, so waiting till you try to figure it out, and that's, that's a waste of time also. And you can't say, well, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to deal with this when I have the time. You see, my schedule's just too full. I've got too much going on. Folks, it will not get easier. It won't. You will not always be able to figure out where it came from. And there's never going to be a better time. We have to deal with this issue of anxiety and stress. And we have to do it right now. We have to do it immediately the moment we recognize it is present. Otherwise, it will grow and it will boil over into something very ugly. Your house will stink when the burner smells of that broth that's burning. Yeah, oh yeah. Somebody else, you've done it too. When she said, oh yeah, she's, she's, she knows what, what we're talking about. Action step number two, say it with me, do it right now. One more time, do it right now. There are nearly 50 scriptures, 50 scriptures that speak about this issue of dealing with the issues of today, today. We cannot put off till tomorrow what we need to address today. Tomorrow may never come. And we don't know what tomorrow will hold. What we are promised is this moment. Did you know that? We aren't promised the next one. What we are promised is this moment. And if we don't take care of what we need to take care of right now, what will happen is is this overwhelming pressure and tension and worry will turn into full-blown anxiety. So how do we address something that if we're honest, none of us really want to address. None of us want to address this issue of anxiety. So how do we do this? And how do we do it so that we are successful? Well, we deal with it immediately. Immediately, the moment it arrives. We don't wait. We don't think upon it. We don't try to figure it out. Because especially when we're talking about uh, stress and anxiety that come from an attack from the enemy. The longer you wait, the bigger it will become. And we don't want the enemy to have uh, this opportunity to continue to spew his lies upon us. Lies that will certainly fill our day with unpleasantness, with fear, with doubt, and even anxiety. 
Proverbs 27, 1 reads, Do not brag about tomorrow, since you do not know what that day will bring. In other words, deal with today's situations today, right now, immediately. Because tomorrow, everything could change. If you don't think so, drive up the road about 20 miles, 25 miles to Sullivan. And talk to those people about all the plans they had for, for their day before the tornado hit. See, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so you can make all of these plans for, for how you're going to deal with something or take care of something tomorrow, but you might not have tomorrow. Or tomorrow, it might not just be this big. It might be this big. A couple years ago, I read this book, the, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the author of this book, I don't believe is a Christian. He doesn't uh, make any reference to that. The book is just supposed to, I was reading the book so that I could learn how to put uh, structure in my day in such a way that I would be effective and efficient and, and could work successfully. So that's why I was reading the book. And, and what I realized as I read the book was that I had a habit that wasn't mentioned in the seven habits of highly effective people. But I had a habit that when I added this habit to the things that I was reading about how to uh, format my day in such a way that I would be efficient and effective, that when I had this habit of immediately seeking Jesus first, and I apply it to these habits that help us to be effective and efficient, I found what I wasn't even expecting. I didn't even know that this was, was going to happen. What I found was one of those seven habits, especially when I added Jesus, it took my stress level down like a hundredfold. And, and it, it, it was one of those things that just happened by accident. I'm reading this book so that I can be efficient and effective. And then I realize, oh, yeah, this is good stuff. Everything in the book I agreed with. Everything that I read, it helped me to be more organized in my day, to be planned and, and structured in such a way that I could be effective and efficient. But then to put it on the path with Jesus and layer them together like this. So here's a habit, and, or here's Jesus, and here's a habit. Here's Jesus, and here's a habit. Here's Jesus, and here's a habit. And it just changed everything for me. And, and the big, big bonus was less stress. And the habit that it was talking about was dealing with things immediately. And, and I remember it talking about dealing with the male, of all things. Like, I, I had never thought that the male caused me stress. But apparently, there are people who go to the mailbox, and that things in the mailbox cause them stress and anxiety. There are bills in there. There's news from Social Security in there. There's, there's all kinds of insurance information. There's all kinds of important things come to us through our mailbox. And so there would be people who literally wouldn't open certain pieces of mail until they felt like they had a handle on their day. And, and, and mail is one of those things that apparently some folks allow to pile up in stacks and stacks and stacks. And it said, no, 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 you don't do that. Not if you want to be effective and efficient. You, right away, when you open a piece of mail, you determine, is this junk? Put it in the trash. Touch it once. The touch it once thing was something that I'm, I'm trying real hard to get a handle on because I, like I like to organize and plan and put things in order. But no, just deal with it and throw it away. Be done with it. If it's something that is, needs to be on your schedule, put it on your schedule and throw it away. Be done with it. If it's a bill, put it in the bill folder. If it's something to do with, with planning or preparing for something, make the notes and then throw it away. Be done with it. But when I put Jesus in the mix of doing it right now, doing it immediately, it was a game changer for me. It just brought peace. In everything I do, just focus on Jesus first. Because the reality, my friends, is stress and anxiety are not bigger than Jesus. 
But sometimes we allow it to so own us that it's almost as if we have stress and anxiety and then here's Jesus. It's not that way. It's not that way at all. When we, when we put Jesus first in our day, when we put Jesus first in our thoughts, when we put Jesus first in our conversation, we, when we put Jesus first before we decide where we're going to go and what we're going to do, it is a game changer because stress and anxiety are not bigger than Jesus and they cannot own you in the same way that Jesus can own you. And we have to realize that, especially when the enemy comes rearing his ugly head and trying to throw stress and anxiety at us. If we are going to put an X through anxiety, we have to have a Jesus first perspective. Jesus first. Then and only then are we able to see the lies that the enemy is trying to push to the forefront of our day. The enemy wants you to believe lies. He wants you to believe things that people are saying about you. He wants you to believe things about other people that are not true. When you hear something that doesn't sound characteristic of someone, instead of going, oh, wow. I wouldn't have thought they would have done that or said that. No, no, no. Put Jesus first. Do I even know that to be true? If I don't know it to be true, don't even think upon it. Move away from it. Do not let the enemy take you down a road that you should not be traveling down. Because the devil, my friends, is never bigger than Jesus. And his lies are never impossible for us to identify if we have a Jesus perspective. With a Jesus perspective, when a lie comes our way, we will first say, I do not know if that is true or not. I'm not going to go there. We can overcome the ugliness that the enemy throws at us as long as we have a Jesus perspective. But it is our responsibility. We have to decide what we're going to focus on. No one can do this for you. A Jesus perspective is something that you own. A Jesus perspective is something that you choose. Will we focus on the liar and the lies? Or will we focus on the giver of truth, Jesus Christ? Will we have a Jesus perspective? And will we we do it right now, immediately? Open a Bible. We're going to turn to page uh, 1021. We are looking at James chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 13. And as we are reading this, what I want you to remember is that, that anxiety can be a very powerful uh, distraction used by the enemy. And why he wants to do this is so that we will not be present in this moment. He wants to cheat you out of the goodness of God. And if we will experience Jesus first, we will experience the goodness of God. But the enemy doesn't want us to do that. So he wants to distract us from being present in this moment. I had somebody tell me last week that they are never happy. That they never have joy. That they are always focusing on how they were raised and the horrific things they went through as a child. And that owns them. When we live like that, we cheat ourselves out of the beauty of this moment. This moment is beautiful. This moment has been given to us from God Almighty for the purpose of us enjoying this moment. Don't cheat yourself out of the goodness of this moment. Be present Trusting Jesus frees us to be present. Verse 13. Uh, Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to go to a certain city. We'll stay there for about a year. We'll do business there. Uh, We're going to make a profit. How do you know what your life is going to be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or do that. 
Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. When we know what we're supposed to do, and we allow the enemy to get a foothold, and we do not do what we are supposed to do, well, then that is sin. I don't want you to hear that planning and preparing for your future is wrong because it's not. Verse 15, uh, James admits that there are certain kinds of planning that are proper when our planning is done according to the authority of the Lord. When we align ourselves with God's will, with God's plan, that kind of planning is proper. Otherwise, all of our planning is sinful. Because it is not about what the Lord desires for us. It's more uh, what does the world want from us or what do we want for ourselves? Not what does the Lord want. Verse 16 goes on to explain that, that when we take pride in our organizational skills and our planning, we are guilty of boasting. Pride and boastfulness, they will lead to to destruction because they are connected to arrogance, they are connected to evilness, and they are connected to sin. This is one of the things that we struggle with, pride. Pride is is one of these things that when we can tackle the issue of pride, it'll take a whole lot of stress out of our life. It'll take anxiety that's connected with this issue of pride out of our life. I want you to hear that because it is hard for us. Because we grow up having, having people say, I'm so proud of you. Or, or you should take pride in what you have done. You should be proud. No, we shouldn't. That's arrogance. And that arrogance will lead to destruction. We need to thank the Lord for this day. That he has given us. And not cheat ourselves out of the goodness that this day holds. See, when we change our thinking and we align our thinking with God's plan and God's will instead of ours, we will see the goodness that this day holds. Uh, Psalm 118.24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We cannot be glad in this day. We cannot be present in this moment. If we are allowing the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow to to bombard us today, today is just gone then. And there is no goodness, not, not according to what the Lord is saying, that we should be rejoicing and we should be glad in this day. Pride and boastfulness do the exact same thing. They cheat us out of experiencing this day because we're so proud of what we're, we've done. Or, or we're boasting about the plans that we have, and then we cannot focus on the goodness of this day. Sometimes when we, when we are prideful and boastful, um, what we are focusing on are the things of this world that will not endure They will not last. They are not dependable. This world is fading. But when you are having this Jesus experience, you are not. When you are present in today, do it right now. Immediately allow yourselves to experience Jesus. What we are focusing on then would be the future that God has willed for us, and that's eternity in heaven. 1 John 2, 15 through 7 reads, Do not love this world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see and pride in our achievements and our possessions. These are not of the Lord. They're not from him, my friends, but they are of this world. Verse 17, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave 
But everyone who does what pleases the Lord will live forever. You want to live forever, you have a Jesus perspective, and you do it immediately. You do it right now. There was a newspaper in Kentucky, and and, uh, they were talking about this issue of what would it look like if you could live your life over. And so they were doing this whole big newspaper um, series on what would it look like talking about uh, uh, the way people had lived their lives and all that kind of thing. And so they decided that they would interview uh, Nadine Stair. She's an 85-year-old woman who was known as uh, the most proper and prim and perfect lady in their community. She had it all pulled together and always had And so they ask Nadine, what would you do if you had your life to live over? You've got to remember, this woman is very respected. She's very proper. And she said, if I could live my life over, I would make more mistakes. Because in those mistakes, I learned how to love. In mistakes, I learned how to forgive and how to be forgiven. In mistakes, I learned. I learned how to move forward. If I could live my life over again, I would relax more. I would loosen up. I would limber up a little. I would certainly be a little sillier than in the life that I have lived. I would take fewer things so seriously. I would take more chances. I would climb more mountains. I would swim more rivers. I would eat more ice cream. I would not choke down as many vegetables. I would perhaps have more actual troubles instead of the imaginary ones that I experienced in my life. You see, I'm one of those people who lives very sensibly Very proper, hour after hour, day after day, year after year. I've been one of those persons who never goes anywhere without everything that she might need. A sweater on my arm, a rain bonnet in my purse, a first aid kit in the car, extra cash in case there is an emergency. I have always planned for everything, so much so that I missed the simple pleasures of what was actually happening. Oh, I've had moments of true stress here and there, but if I could do it over again, I think I would have more of them. Just moments, one after another, instead of always living in the days ahead, instead of always planning for what might happen. If I could live my life again, I would travel this life a little lighter and I would experience today. Action step number two, do it right now. Experience today. Allow yourself to have a Jesus first perspective. When doubts and fears and worries Overwhelm us. Do it right now. Change your perspective. God's word tells us that when we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. In other words, say it with me. Do it right now. Stand with me and let's pray. Father God, as we take our seat reminders home and we look at these few words here, do it right now, and we focus on the truth that when we draw near to you, you change us, you transform us because you allow us to draw near to you. You allow us to stand in your goodness. You allow us to experience your love. You allow us to be covered by your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, help us to realize this issue of stress and anxiety. It doesn't have to own us. That, Father, when we are in your presence, that things change. That we we see your power and your strength. 
Father, this morning as we are talking about this issue of of having a Jesus perspective, there may be somebody in this room who's yet to say that Jesus is my Savior, that Jesus is the one that I'm living for. So with all eyes closed, with all heads bowed, if you want to invite Jesus into your life, you have to make a declaration. This is just between you and the Lord. Everyone's head is bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. Slip your hand in the air so that I can see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. God, fill us up in a way that only you can. Allow us to have a do it right now Jesus perspective. Allow your kingdom to grow and use us. In Jesus' name. Amen.